Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's switch gear and talk about another revolutionary technique which is polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Something very similar to gene cloning but here you are using some chemicals to make multiple copies of a given gene. A scientist which is uh, we have, who has made uh, in a seminal contribution to this field, Carrie Millis, in 1984, uh, he uh, first time discovered this process polymerase chain reaction. And some of these discoveries happen sometimes accidentally. If you remember I was mentioning to you in you know old environment when we had these archaea bacteria and some of the very you know the organism living in the extreme conditions especially you know the halophiles and some of the thermophiles those who were living in the extreme hot condition. Uh, if you observe those particular organism you might be able to derive certain properties from it. And therefore Carrie Mullis was able to isolate some bacteria from a very hot spring of the uh, sulfur hot spring uh, from which she was able to get some bacteria thermos aquaticus uh, who can uh, withstand and still reproduce at 95 degrees and 100 degrees temperature. So now these enzymes gives that bacteria that property which can actually make it uh, still live in those hot temperature. So he used isolated that enzyme uh, tag polymerase and that was actually pretty instrumental in developing this particular a technique known as polymerase chain reaction. So broadly in polymerase chain reaction you have three processes. One is the DNA strands to separate your double stranded DNA. You will heat them, denature them so that the double stranded DNA becomes single stranded. They get separated. Then you want to have some primers or a short stretch of nucleotides which will bind on both the opposite end of the pair from 5, degree, five prime to 3 primes. And then you want to have the DNA synthesis using TAC polymerase all the nucleotides which are required, magnesium chloride, etc. everything you add in the reaction mix. So the success of polymerase chain reaction came, came from the key discovery of uh, knowing about TAC polymerase which was isolated from Thermos aquaticus living in the hot, hot springs. The stability of this DNA polymerase at very high temperature was very useful to, to derive this process of polymerase chain reaction because this bacteria was able to live and reproduce even at 95 degrees temperature and therefore the enzyme tag polymerase which were isolated from it became very useful for this process. So broadly these are the three, three steps which happens in a polymerase chain reaction. First you have the double stranded DNA which you are denaturing at very high temperature 95 degrees or 100 degrees and now this becomes two single stranded DNA. Then you are adding a short stretch of uh, nucleotides which can hybridize to the complementary uh, base pairing rule in the same manner. And now from both the sides you are giving you know that situation where now the second strand of the DNA can be synthesized. To do this part you are adding the tag polymerase. You are also providing the right temperature here which is annealing temperature and you are adding all the DNTPs, all the nucleotides which are required for the synthesis. This thing is happening as a part of extension when now a new strand is being formed. So now the single stranded DNA became double stranded and one copy of DNA became two copies of DNA here. In this whole thing what is most important to understand is primers. What are the primers? You have any idea or understanding for what are the primers? Alright, so these are uh, if you have a large gene sequence Within the large gene sequence, you do not want to amplify the full gene. You might want to amplify a, you know, a, a large region of that. So you are finding some region which can be used to amplify the, the gene and you are synthesizing some nucleotides which are having some complementary opposite base pairs. And you are using those short stretch of nucleotides which could be 18 to 28 nucleotide in length as a starting point for the DNA synthesis to happen. Now these you are you know uh, in some way you are just adding ATGC and putting that based on the complementary sequence of DNA. So you want to ensure that you are picking up the sequence from a region 
which is not having too much GC contents or if you are not having the same base pair in multiples present like you know not A's continuous or, or G's continuous present. So and they should not be self complementary as well. One more important thing here is that known as TM or the melting temperature because if you go back this process which is annealing you are uh, giving a specific temperature for this primer to bind to the DNA strands and this happens at a specific temperature which is known as annealing temperature. So you can actually calculate what can be possible annealing temperature by looking at uh, calculating the AT and GC contents. So this is the formula for doing that you can have A plus T times 2 plus G and C contents times 4 that will give you the TM value and that TM value could be 65 degrees or 70 degrees can be used as the annealing temperature. So initially you used a very high temperature which was for denaturation then you are reducing the temperature down now you are bringing a primer to bind to that particular DNA strands using annealing temperature and then you want to extend it further again you are changing temperature around 72 degrees for the TAC polymerase to work. So let, let's look at one of this sequence and uh, let's assume that you have to design the primers for this particular gene sequence and you want to amplify this you know starting from this arrow region to this arrow region you want to amplify this gene. So for both the DNA strands we have mentioned here the, the full sequence here. So for the forward primer you have to have the complementary opposite base pairs. So if A is there or the G is here what will be the complementary base pair? C right. If you have A then C then what will be complementary? So can you start writing about what can be the forward primer sequence please write that. That will be in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. This is gene sequence we have want to amplify the gene from this part here. To do this we are saying that you can start making a primer you can synthesize the primer that will be the forward primer will be complementary to this particular segment which you want to amplify. So if you have just opposite sequence of that in 5 prime to 3 prime direction that can be your forward primer. Now the reverse primer is much more simpler and easy because we are deriving everything from 5 prime to 3 prime you are synthesizing in fact chemically synthesizing the primers. We now know how to synthesize chemically ATGC bases. So a primer nucleotide sequence can be synthesized it comes in the powder form and then you can actually you know uh, add some water to make your primer mix. So now everything you want to have always in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. This is what you have uh, used here for the forward primer. Now if opposite primer you want to design from this part here it becomes much more simpler because you are just writing the sequence of the other DNA strand in this case for the reverse primer and therefore your sequence for the reverse primer will become uh, starting from C it will become C A T G C C A and you can continue with that. Are you with me? So you want to amplify a given gene segment and I have shown you the arrows from this part to this part you want to amplify that DNA. To do that you are adding a small stretch of nucleotides which you want to chemically synthesize along with those chemical synthesized primers you will add the enzyme you will add nucleotides you will make the mixture everything provide the right temperature conditions inside the instrument and perform polymerase chain reaction so that your DNA can keep multiplying multiple copies that is the intention here. To do this the forward primer you have taken from 5 prime to 3 prime direction you have just used the complementary sequence of it and you got this particular sequence derived for the forward primer. Reverse primer the opposite strand of this which we have used for this DNA and because we have to derive in 5 prime to 3 prime information we are just simply writing the sequence from the CAT onwards. So this is way you can synthesize and design these primers. Now if I am giving you this particular primer sequence which is from the 5 prime to 3 prime what will be the melting temperature given that you have this formula which will not be shown in the exam what will be the melting temperature TM for this particular primer straightforward just count 8 T's G's and C's. So if this was a temperature to be used for PCR so the second uh, condition which is annealing you are going to use 64 degrees for annealing. 
because you have some theoretical idea that this is the right temperature how my base pairs will have the best annealing or the binding conditions so you will use 64 degrees for the annealing condition to happen yes how exactly do you get that expression for the temperature all right i think his question is right that you know let's say you have derived some theoretical value of 64 degrees how exactly it actually will help into amplifying that gene of interest that's a very i think a you know, practical question theoretically you should see a band amplified because of the tm but usually you know plus minus 2 degrees can happen so sometime that you are deriving 64 degree that may happen 66 degree can be the right temperature for that gene to amplify it is possible so you have to play with certain temperature conditions to find out what is the best temperature for your gene of interest to bind so now you had started from uh, the double helix dna the double stranded dna after doing the denaturation you got the single stranded ones you added these primers which are the short stretch of nucleotides which you have designed yourself because you wanted to study that gene of lamin a for example and now you are amplifying that gene of interest now you have added dntps and nucleotides and providing the right temperature conditions so that the nucleotides are getting synthesized and new strands are being made so now this became double stranded dna this whole thing is only one cycle of pcr now same way you are repeating the pcr cycle second time third time and now you can do it n number of times ideally people go for at least 30 to 35 or 40 cycles to make multiple copies of the gene of interest so just imagine that after each cycle of performing the polymerase chain reaction you are generating n number of fragments and therefore for many of the forensic applications think about any kind of you know the crime scene when there is some hair is fallen or some sort of blood spot is is detected over there you don't have too much dna to do lot of investigation so they use those small part of those you know the the dna extracted out of those bio specimens and then amplify those using these kind of conditions with the polymerase chain reaction so that they have enough of the dna to then do further testing which can result into very accurate detection so uh, we are performing here multiple cycles in any of the polymerase chain reaction uh, a three step cycle brings about the chain reaction which produces the the dna chains in the exponential manner and after each successive cycle you will have the target sequences which will double the numbers and these numbers will double 2 to the power n so if you have done 30 cycle or 40 cycle ideally it looks only 10 cycle difference but if you think think about 2 to the power 30 or 2 to the power 40 there is a huge number of difference in how many copies you are producing for that gene of interest so once you do the pcr there are many things to be optimized of course as somebody rightly mentioned you have to look at the annealing temperature what is the best temperature in which your primers are going to bind and you may have to play within a range of temperatures from 60 to 65 or 70 to find out where your gene binds the best with the primers and then you have to see that at which cycle numbers you can still see enough of the dna being produced so then what you can do after doing the polymerase chain reaction you can run your samples on the gel so many times people do uh, this gradient pcr where they will use different gradient of temperature and now they will run the each pcr condition let's say starting here 60 62 64 and 66 and these are my lanes and and what i'm finding it you know the very faint band is appearing at 62 probably you know a good band i can see at 64 so then probably the 64 is the right temperature for me to take my experiments forward so this is how people first try to visualize where their you know the primers are going to get best bind to the uh, the gene of interest and now once you have done that then you will do 30 or 35 or 40 cycles to amplify and make enough number of copies of the gene of interest all right so within you know few hours of doing this pcr or polymerase chain reaction you can actually amplify your dna sufficient so that you can make multiple copies of that specific target and then you can do a lot of gene testing based on the amplified dna which is present in the given sample now just imagine that you know uh, so far we have been talking about all the things happening at the gene level now let's think about you wanted to study an aberration or the change happening at the protein level especially if you think about the context of progeria there was a protein which was lamin a which is defective coming because of the defects from the lamin a gene 
So if you think about the, the DNA sequence, all these triplet codons are going to make one amino acid. So let's say we have glycine from triple G, phenylalanine from TTC and like that we have you know, multiple amino acids derived from these triplet codons sequence. So the three letter nucleotides they are corresponding to a given amino acid sequence and these nucleotide sequences could be translated to give you an amino acid sequence or looking at the polypeptide chain of that given protein. So if you want to study let's say a, you know change happening at the protein level from the same kind of cloning experiment and the same idea of what we have discussed for the doing cloning can you now think about can you study those changes at, even at the protein level. That's something I think you have to now pay attention. So let's imagine that you have a particular protein which you want to study and because in that protein there is some change happening at one amino acid level and that each amino acid is derived from the triplet codon of the gene sequence. So if you are looking at that gene sequence for example TCT is the gene sequence for serine and you are just replacing a C with the G therefore the TCT becomes TGT which becomes another amino acid which is cysteine just by changing one base pair you have changed the triplet codon you have changed from one amino acid to other amino acid which has introduced so much change in the living system right. So now if you think about even when you are designing the primer even when you are studying the things at the gene level if you want to introduce the changes at the protein level subsequently you can think about what changes you can make in the triplet codons which may result into the changes at the protein level right. So if you had this particular template strand if this is a strand which is normal and now you want to create a protein which is having slight difference only with one particular place. Now this one nucleotide you have made a change and now a protein which is going to be derived from it or amino acid sequence going to be derived from it will have mismatch will have different as compared to the parental strand right. So this is how if you, you are designing the primers at the uh, site of primer designing itself you can make some small changes and those may result into the variations which can be seen if after doing the cloning then you can see those changes happening even at the protein level. So to study the particular proteins uh, still people have used bacterial as a system uh, and just imagine it is very complex concept because think about we are you know eukaryotes and very complex human system and now for our human proteins to grow we are still using bacterial system which is prokaryotic system right. So but, but somehow with the genetic engineering we have been able to overcome these barriers and we are still able to even grow the proteins of our interest in the bacteria. So proteins of eukaryotic interest into uh, prokaryotic origin. So the cells express the different versions of the proteins and result into the phenotypes which can actually inform about the normal versus the aberrant function of the given proteins and we can use those information to express eukaryotic proteins in bacterial system although it is very challenging and it's still a question that how different eukaryotic and bacterial cells are and how you can use the bacterial system to even make the human protein or the eukaryotic protein that's really a challenging question. So if you want to use the bacterial system to, to express a given protein of interest you have to use certain promoters which are going to overcome this problem in the expression vector. So expression vector is a cloning vector which contains certain bacterial promoter which can provide the eukaryotic genes in the correct reading frame. So uh, there are a lot of difference in the prokaryotic and eukaryotic system and of course you do not assume that your eukaryotic proteins are going to be made in bacteria very correctly and going to be properly folded. But somehow you are still trying to use certain expression vectors so some of the cloning vectors where you have some of the promoters inserted upstream of the resection sites which help you to at least put the things in the right frame so that the right amino acids can be synthesized based on the that particular expression. So bacterial host cell would recognize the promoter and express the foreign genes or the eukaryotic genes which are linked to that promoter. So now let us 
take this particular situation which is really really complex uh, situation but we want to study a complex uh, mutant protein think about this part which is the cloning part which we are already pretty much familiar with now right so all the thing which i have talked so far is now summarized in this particular image let's pay attention to this image and see which are all thing which we can discuss from here so we have discussed we had a plasmid vector where you wanted to insert a gene of your interest you made this recombinant dna and now you have done the transformation you selected that and now you got the bacterial colony which are having your gene of interest right this is what we discussed earlier now this dna which is a fragment now this particular dna you can also amplify using polymerase chain reaction if you have very small copies of this dna you can make multiple copies of it using pcr for doing pcr or polymerase chain reaction you had used certain uh, 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 primers which are from the both the sides right you have annealed certain primers and those primers are the one which are going to amplify the gene of interest now in the primer sequence itself if you can introduce some variation which can change your triplet codon so that your proteins which are going to be synthesized from it will have some changes you already know from which codon what amino acid is going to be synthesized so if you only make even one change in the base pair of the primer sequence even that will result into mutation or different change so therefore at the primer designing level itself people can do lot of innovation lot of ideas comes that you want to study a different form or different uh, gene now you can make those changes at the primer designing level now you do pcr so your gene of interest will now contain certain added base pair or certain less base pairs right that you can do using polymerase chain reaction and once you have done that then the rest of this step of cloning remains same now you can have rest of this step in the exactly same format the way we have been discussing now all of these things whatever we are uh, talking for the dna work uh, everything you have to rely on your simple electrophoretic uh, apparatus you have to amplify your gene you have to run on the gel and you have to see that where what the size of this particular band is am i able to amplify my right gene now let's say if you have made a change in the gene because of the primer sequence which you have added now is there some amplification you can see or some deletion you can see a small base pair change those you can again monitor on the agarose gels so these are the kind of some certain uh, you know technique which are very interesting for us to study uh, do we have a pcr polymerase chain reaction all right so uh, shortly we are going to show you a thermal cycler the instrument which is very simple you know engineering innovation it's like three simple thermostats and in those thermostats you are just very precisely changing the temperature so while pcr looks like you know big technique but uh, you know shortly we are going to show you the instrument the polymerase chain reaction it's very simple instrument thermal cycler where we are just precisely regulating our temperature first initially you are heating it at very high temperature 100 degrees then you are lowering the temperature based on your annealing temperature could be 55 or 60 degrees and then you are again doing extension at 72 degrees so by using these temperature changes you are able to synthesize dna using pcr so it's again a very simple small instrument but with just works on a very much precision of the temperature and that has to be monitored